Hey guys, here we are for chapter 15, and we're gonna talk about non-renewable resources. Well, as always, we're going to jump into a da, 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 case study. Absolutely. The case study in this chapter is fracking. Hydraulic fracking, hydro fracking, or just fracking. It's all the same thing. Probably technically it really should be referred to as hydraulic fracking, but it's all the same. This is where we have known for years that oil and natural gas were trapped deep underground in shale. Now shale is a rock formation deep underground and there's oil and natural gas trapped up in it. We just didn't really have any access to get to it that was cost effective. But as prices have risen and technology has improved, we have figured out a way to get to it. Well, the picture behind me is kind of showing what we're doing. It's way deep down, up under these deep aquifers, which we talked about before, which we can access for water, but they have potential problems with radioactivity and some heavy metals in them. So all the way down up under that, we drill down vertically, and then we drill horizontally into the shale deposits. And we pump, hydraulic pump, a slurry of sand, water, and chemicals. And the companies that put this mix in do not have to release what all the chemicals are, trade secret, if you will, but many of them are kind of hazardous. They pump it into the shale, and it causes the shale to crack, fracture. As it fractures and the sand wedges in some of these cracks, then they pump out the rest of this slurry along with the oil or natural gas. Pump it up to the top so they can separate out the oil or natural gas from these chemical slurry. But the oil and the natural gas coming up tend to be tainted with these chemicals as well as heavy metals and they have some radioactive traces in them. So all of that waste has to be dealt with as well. So we pump everything into the cracks, we produ produces a hazardous waste slurry. That is what is pumped up, getting the oil, but then we have to deal with this waste. We'll look at it again later of what we do with it. Do we store it up on the surface where it can cause hazards, get into water? Sometimes we drill it deep underground and just store it back underground. It's probably one of the safest ways, but most expensive. But anyway, fracking uh, as a case study, we'll revisit it later. But in chapter 15.1, we're gonna largely talk about the energy resources in general. 90% of the commercial energy, you know, you flip on the lights, you turn on your air conditioner, you listening to stereo at home, whatever it may be, these come from non-renewable resources. Oil, natural gas, and coal. Coal is one of our really big ones for electricity, but once again, transportation, moving around, all of these cooking natural gas. For me at my house, it's a uh, natural gas, it runs our heating, and then sometimes it's cooking, it all depends on your setup. But it heats our house and it heats our hot water, natural gas, electricity for most everything else, which comes from burning coal here at GRU. By and large, there's some other ways that we do it. The energy resources can vary greatly in what we call their net energy. The amount of available energy from a resource minus the amount of energy needed to make it available. Like, the gasoline that goes in my car. Well, we don't find gasoline out in the real world. We have to drill down to the oil. We have to pump the oil up. Then the oil has to make it to the refinery. It goes into the refinery and we refine the crude oil into like diesel or gasoline. Gasoline then gets delivered to the gas station, put down into the tank, and then I drive up, turn on the pump, and pump it into my gas. So there's the energy contained in the crude oil or the energy contained in the gasoline, but to talk about how much available energy, I've got to talk about its 
net energy, if you will, because it took a whole lot of energy to get to it. And that is one of the things that we will break down and look at. In other words, it's like a business. Let's say you make, there's at the end of the year, you've sold $1 million worth of goods. Well, but if your expenses were $900,000, you only made $100,000 uh, out of it. It's low energy, if you will, or low profits compared to when you look at, oh, we did a million dollars worth of business, but $900,000 of it was paying the employees, getting the product, you know, there wasn't as much in the way of profit. This is what we're looking at in energy. And some things are high energy yield. It doesn't take as much energy in, and oil's actually one of these, all those steps I talked about, we still wind up with a net pretty high energy. Some things are low, and some energy sources are actually negative. It takes more energy to get the thing than it's actually worth. Now, the energy that heats up the earth, the energy that drives everything is the sun. And ultimately, everything can be traced back to it. Fossil fuels got their energy from the sun, died, we're reusing them. But the commercial energy that you and I get, it's either going to be non-renewable, that's what we're going to talk in this chapter, or renewable. Non-renewable, oil, coal, natural gas, and nuclear energy. The renewables, largely solar, hydropower, biomass, burning plant matter, geothermal, and wind. So we will talk about those in the next chapter, but we'll look at these. Take a look at the pie graph up here behind me. Now, the left-hand side, that is the world use, and the right-hand side is the U.S. use. And if you look, the non-renewable, it is 88% in the world is using non-renewable. Now, if you look, the world use is 89% comes from non-renewable, and in the U.S. it's 88% from non-renewable. Well, you know, so slightly better with using our renewables. Also, it's kind of funny, the one on the right, they have that green thing slid down because actually nuclear energy is non-renewable and they have that green thing slid off. It's just an error, I think, in the printing. So the green thing should be over the orange and the uh, yellow, not over the red, but the percentages are still correct. It's just a little bit off. So once again, oil is kind of the lion's share. And in the United States, we're using a little more oil than the world overall, than coal. The world's using a little more coal than we do and gets into nuclear power. We're using nuclear a little more and we finally get into our non-renewables, geothermal, etc. So once again, the world use compared to the U.S. use, you know, there's not a huge drastic difference, you know, 89% versus 88. But once again, just a thing to look at where our energy sources come from. But once again, we want to talk about weaning ourselves off of non-renewable energy sources. We've got a long way to go. However, every little bit helps. And that's really the push right now with renewables is to use renewables more and more so we can preserve the amount of oil that's there and we have, don't have to go to extremes to get it out of the ground. So let's talk about that net energy because when it comes to all these forms of energy, that's really the bottom line, right? What is the net? What can we get out of it? So just like I talked about with oil, we have to pump it out, we have to transfer it, you gotta get it to the refinery, get it into the tank, deliver it to the consumers, and then you and I use it. The net energy yield, the amount of high quality energy, once again, we talked about high quality, low quality, the amount of energy minus the energy needed to put in. So the formula is very simple, net energy, what I'm able to get out, equals the energy output minus the energy input. How much energy do I get out of a liter of gasoline versus how much energy did we put in to get the liter of? And this is our straight up formula for it. It's just net equals the output minus the input. 
because we expect to get more energy out than we put in. It's not always the case, but it's what we're after. Now the net energy ratio, kind of really known as our energy returned on the investment, you know, we put all this energy into getting it, what are we gonna get out? This is the amount of energy obtained per unit, which is used to obtain it. And so our net energy ratio is gonna be the energy output divided by the energy input. Let's take it like before, if we had a million dollars and 900,000 of it was profit. Well, the nine minus or 10 minus nine equals one. Or if we take 10 divided by nine, it equals 1.1. So our net energy ratio in this 10 to nine is a 1.1 or our net energy yield would be the 10 minus nine. So net energy yield would be 10 minus nine, or if it was 1 million minus 900 for 100,000. But if I take it and I put it into the net energy ratio, a million divided by 900,000, I'm still getting to be this you know, 1.1. Both of those would be low, if you will. The chart I'm going to put up here, um, letting it take full screen so you can see it a little better, is showing the net energy yield of certain things. If we're talking about electricity, well, hydropower, we get very high. It's where we make a dam and let the water flow down. A wood, high. Coal, high. Natural gas, we're getting the medium. Geothermal in the medium. Anyway, you can look at the various things that we have and do, but our net energy yield. So if we're talking about heating up a room, what have you, we have the different things, whether we're getting high efficiency or low efficiency. But these are just some of the ones that we look at. And obviously we want to move towards things or utilize things that tend to have high efficiency instead of the low efficiency. Now, some of our energy resources need subsidies. In other words, without the subsidies, you and I would not wind up being able to use them. The cost would simply be too high. Sometimes we provide subsidies for some other reason. Nuclear energy. Once again, we need power. Nuclear energy is one way to go about it. Nuclear energy by and large is clean. It's not polluting. We're not putting nitrous oxide into the atmosphere, we're not putting carbon dioxide into the air. We are left with a radioactive core that for somewhere between 50 to 100,000 years has to be put in a hazardous waste bin. But day in, day out, it's a non-polluting resource. So subsidies have to be paid, otherwise it winds up being too expensive. Once again, nuclear energy is just one of those. Another thing we will look at or talk about is energy density. How much energy do, do I get out of a kilogram of whatever? So if I have a kilogram, if it's liquid, we'd normally go into liters. So if I have a liter of oil, how much energy do I get out of that compared to a liter of corn oil or a liter of uranium, uranium solid, but we get the idea. We can talk about energy density the amount of energy available per kilogram of the resource. Of course, this can be a little misleading. For instance, energy density of hydrogen is incredibly high, but overall, the hydrogen has a negative energy. It takes so much energy to create the hydrogen, even though hydrogen is incredibly energy dense and rich and it's non-polluting when we use it, it costs more money to produce the hydrogen than the energy we get out of it. Uranium is one of the same things. Uranium is what we use in our nuclear power, but all the energy it takes to get, refine, treat, care for, build the facility to handle this radioactive material, even though it's incredibly energy dense, it still winds up being low because of all the energy input to get it out. So the energy output's high, but the energy input's incredibly high. With hydrogen, 
it's not likely going to be our savior unless we can come up with ways to extract it or get it into a kilogram of usable energy that our output winds up being higher than our input. Currently, it's negative. Well, this wraps us up for section one, our energy resources. Come back next time and we'll specifically look at oil. Take care, guys.